I'm going to start the recording. And uh, welcome you all again to our second Genealogy Academy on Family Search. Um, I hope some of you have um, had some a chance to uh, work with um, the uh, Ancestry Library Edition that we talked about last time. Uh, today we're going to talk about Family Search. There are, um, I like to think of doing genealogy research and the resources we have as um, kind of a, a barbell that you use with weightlifting. And um, the two weights on the end are ancestry <clears throat> and family search. They're both equally robust and equally valuable. Uh, they don't have the exact same um, sources. And if you're only using one of them, you're missing out on a lot. So you've got Ancestry under your belt. Tonight, you're going to learn about Family Search, and you will be ready to roll with your genealogy research. So what is Family Search anyway? You might be asking yourself, um, and I will answer. The first thing to know about Family Search is that it's absolutely free. You don't have to pay anything for it. It's not a subscription. You can use it at home. Um, so uh, that is one good thing about it. Another very important thing to know is that it's part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is also known as the Mormon Church. Um, Family Search website is sponsored by this church. Um, for their members because genealogy is a very important part of the Mormon faith, but they make all of their information available to everyone, to all genealogists. I shouldn't say all their information. I'd say most of their information. And um, you do not have to be a member of the church to use this site. Um, the Mormon Church has been acquiring, copying, and microfilming genealogical records from around the world for decades. And they microfilmed that information and made the microfilm available to other people um, to preserve the um, information on this microfilm. They actually store it in a granite mountain vault. Well, that was last century. Now in the digital age, um, Family Search has been digitizing those microfilms and putting the images on their Family Search website. But out of fairness to the institutions that own those original records and that, um, yeah, that own the original records, Family Search has gone back and renegotiated um, access rights to the digital image of what they already have on microfilm. So the institutions can um, make uh, the information available on the internet, but it's not a yes or no, either or question. There are lots of levels of access that you can get to these records. There's a public access that everyone can see. There is an affiliate library or family history center access. Um, and Cook Library is an affiliate library. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. There's access um, only at the Family History Library, capital F Family, capital History, capital L Library in Salt Lake City. And there are some things that only church members have access to. Um, they link to other partner sites as well. And some of those sites are free and some of them are not. The Family Search site um, is composed of records, indexes, books, family trees, and much, much more. I thought just for um, an interesting sidelight, we'd uh, show you a picture of the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. Um, some of us in the genealogy world like to call this the mothership, which is where all the information is stored and um, disseminated. Uh, people travel to um, Salt Lake City like they travel to Mecca. And um, I'm trying not to be too facetious here, but um, it is a place that most gen genealogists yearn to visit at least once in their lifetime because there are some things that you can only get when you're there. And I also thought you'd be interested to see this picture, which is actually the Granite Mountain Vault. 
I don't know if you thought I was kidding about that, but I'm not. It's a real mountain. And um, you can see uh, a, a driveway kind of in there. Nobody is allowed in there except those very select few people who are parking there. And the microfilm that um, the church has um, put together, everything is stored in there for um, very secure, safe keeping. Now, another thing about familysearch.org um, is that it's sort of organic is the word I like to use. Um, this website was launched in 1999, which in digital years is like ancient times. So um, you can imagine that it has changed a lot since then um, in its organization and how things are accessed. Um, it's just grown in directions all over the place. And um, because it's so big and has so many facets and so many ways of getting to things, um, you really have to kind of hunker down and, and learn about this a little bit. Um, it's not quite as intuitive as a website or database like Ancestry. But that's why you're here and that's what we're going to learn tonight. So let's get started. As far as how to use FamilySearch, the first thing you need to do is make an account with them. It's free to make an account and you will never be um, solicited or asked to join the church in any way. Um, some people are worried about their privacy and that's something that you can control on here. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later too. But um, really you do need to make an account because those levels of access that I mentioned, um, there are a lot of things that are available to um, account holders that you can't get to without uh, an account. So to do that, go to the website, which is familysearch.org. And um, you can see here in the top right hand corner, this is not what the site looks like, but in the top hand corner of the main page, there's a button that says create an account. So you want to click on that. And all you have to fill in is your first and last name, your birth date, and uh, whether you're male or female. Um, if you're a member of the church, you, you would want to click that to kind of add your extra access to yourself and then press continue. You'll be asked to make a password and write it down because you'll need to put your username and password in every time you access this. I also want to make you aware of the fact that um, they have a lot of research help on the family search website. They want you to use this information and they want to make sure that you can get it. Um, the research, there are four places that uh, you can go for help. Um, one is the research wiki, which we will take a look at. So I'll tell you about that later. Um, they have online classes. They have research groups that um, are listed in the family search wiki at that website. A lot of them are on Facebook, believe it or not. And um, there are people who are researching the same area, the same um, types of records uh, that can help you, or maybe you can help someone else and let them benefit from your experience. And finally, there is a contact us section where you can contact them by phone um, or there's a chat. Um, I don't think there's email. But um, I have used both of those uh, help resources, um, some of them rather late at night, and um, there's always somebody on duty. So if you get stuck, um, <clears throat> don't be afraid to reach out to Family Search. Okay. Um, oh, just one more thing. Um, everyone who signed up tonight should have gotten um, a handout which um, is pretty bare bones. It's more like an outline that can help you um, keep track of where we are. But all of these um, links on the screen that you see here should be on the website or on the, on the handout sheet. All right, let's go, familysearch.org. 
um, believe me, if you do re if you do genealogy for any much longer, your your fingers will uh, type this what without even thinking it. FamilySearch.org is the name of the website. And here, this is the main page, which um, changes. They often have cute pictures of people doing genealogy. Um, here's that button up here in the top, create an account, just like the one you saw before. Um, I'm going to sign in because um, that's what we need to do when we use this site. And here we are. There's a lot of stuff on here. Um, but because there's so much stuff, I can't go into everything. So I'm going to try to um, zero down into the um, most important ways to access and find information and um, some search techniques as well, because um, this is a step up and you're going to have to, uh, you know, put on your um, detective hat and do a little digging. Some things are not handed to you, um, but that, that's what makes finding it all the more fun. All right, um, where we're going to start today is um, up here in the top left hand corner, it says family search. And if you kind of fall down a rabbit hole or can't find your way back to what you're looking for, clicking on this icon will always take you to this home page. So it's always good to know that there's an out. And um, if you get stuck anywhere and want to start over, just click on the family search icon. This uh, menu bar here has um, a lot of things that you can uh, look into. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them, so feel free to poke around and find out more about them. Um, as long as we're here, I thought I would mention this family tree. Um, you can and are encouraged to have a family tree on this website. Um, I personally don't. Um, I did put a few things on here, but I don't maintain it. Um, and the reason that I choose not to is because that um, Family Search has this uh, grand plan, which is not a bad idea to have everybody uh, connected in one big family tree. Um, but to accomplish that, they let people change things in your family tree. And sometimes that can get a little bit sticky. However, if you don't have an account with Ancestry and you want to connect to people, this might be a good way to do it. So um, it, just like Ancestry, you can add things onto your family tree that you find in this website. Um, you can grow and you can get hints. Um, it's up to you whether or not you want to do it. I wouldn't uh, counsel you one way or another, but um, just have kind of told you my um, experience with that. What we're going to focus on tonight is the search button right here. Like I said, the rest of these things you can poke around and um, explore if you're curious. But I'm going to click on the search button. And doing that gives other options right away that you can search. You can search for records, images, family trees, genealogies, the catalog, books, and the research wiki. Um, even all those we don't have time to go through, but we will hit the high spots. And if you can make sense or master or become familiar with these searching strategies, like in records, the catalogs, book, and the research wiki, um, you will uh, make good use of family search. I did want to, sorry, I keep teasing you and um, I don't mean to do that, but one other thing I wanted to show you is that um, make sure you understand what you're searching and what you're finding with this because there are indexes and there are images. Um, the, this on the left is an image uh, taken from a digitized microfilm and we'll see this more, this will pop up several times in our um, evening tonight. Um, it's a picture of the original document that the um, LDS church made when they were microfilming. Um, it allows you to make your own judgments and lets you uh, decipher the handwriting um, and take a look at what is, um, what is on the document. This on the right here is an index to the original document. Um, the information has been 
extracted or interpreted from that original document and not all the information from the original document is included in the index. Um, we'll probably talk a little bit more about indexing late, later, how, how that happens, and you could even do that yourself. But it's important to know that mistakes can be made um, when someone indexes something. Uh, you might not be able to understand the handwriting. Um, you might not be familiar with the area. And um, so point is always, 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 even if you find an index, go to the original source so that you can decide what that source says and how it fits into what you know and if that's relevant for your research. Indexes are not records and genealogy is built on the information that we get from the records. All right, I think, nope, that's not it. Where are we here? There we are. Um, whoops, <laughs> sorry guys. Uh, let me see if we can get back to family search. There we go. Okay, so, under search, let's start with searching records. We're going to search the historical records on Family Search. There's a pretty simple search box here. Um, a lot of the parts of the website that we're familiar with are up here on the left, um, including the icon if we, if we get stuck. But let's take a look and see what it looks like to search um, for a record here. My example is going to be um, a great great grandfather, um, Andrew Hedin, who lived in Aurora, Illinois. Um, that's all I'm going to put in. If you know more about an ancestor and want to add more information, you can um, provide birth information, marriage, death information with dates. You can add the name of a parent, um, sibling, spouse. Um, that's if you have a, maybe a common name or get, get two hits, too many hits. But this is all um, I'm going to do right now and I'm going to hit search. And my records come up with 858 and um, with a list of all or sort of an index to the records that we've seen. I want to take a minute to just explain these icons on the right here. Anytime you see something that looks like a little piece of paper, that means it's only an index. If you see a camera, that means there's an image associated with that record. So you will be able to see a digital image. Let me go down a little farther here and there's a different kind of icon that is a camera within a piece of paper, it looks like. But what that means is that this image is at a partner site, which in this case is Find a Grave. And we're gonna talk about Find a Grave in next month's Academy free genealogy websites. So um, if you see this, you will know that um, clicking on this record is gonna take you out of Family Search. Um, to another website, and the information there may or may not be free. Um, and then the last icon I wanted to show you is this um, family tree. And this means that um, he's in somebody, somebody has put this person in their family tree. All right, let's go back up to the top. I'm going to look at this first um, record here. When I click on his name, it kind of opens up a little um, mini uh, index record here um, with his name, age, death date, uh, occupation, parents, um, spouse's name, and that kind of thing. And look down here. When you get down farther, you can see there's an image um, that you can click on to view the original image. I want to, I'm not going to do that right now because I want to show you if you click on this right here, view this record. Let me back up just a second because I'm seeing this um, icon here that said it was only an index, but now I'm looking at it. 
and it's a, there's an image attached to it. Why would that be? We will discuss that in a moment. <laughs> but right now, let's look at this view record. That opens up um, a new window and kind of lets you see everything a little more clearly, including on the right hand side here, similar records. So um, these are um, hints like Ancestry gave. Um, so take advantage of those. I um, just want to point out that, um, and you probably saw this on the uh, list of um, search results, um, FamilySearch has all the United States Census on it. And um, if you don't have a subscription to Ancestry and can't get into the library to use Ancestry Library Edition, FamilySearch is a great substitution, a substitute way to get at those um, census records. So here's the index information, and we've talked about that already, what that is and how to um, you know, take it with a grain of salt, look at the original document, which we're gonna do in a second. But remember that there was just a little piece of paper uh, in the search result hinting that this was only an index. And if I had been at home, actually I asked my husband to look this up earlier to verify this for me, and he did. At home, you would see not the image here, but the words that say image unavailable. And that's because the Illinois State Archives is one of those um, institutions who has decided that they do not want to make all their information publicly available. They want to restrict it to people who are in either a family search affiliate library like we are, or a family search history library which is not the same as the Family History Library, um, a Family History Center Library, I should say, Family History Center Library, is connected to um, an LDS church. Um, the Mormon churches have uh, libraries attached to them with a lot of good information in them, and they are open to the public, uh, limited hours. Um, so, Keep that in mind that if you're researching something from home and you get to this point and see something that says image unavailable, that means that you're going to have to go somewhere else to get it. Now, we don't know what the access point is. You might come to the library and um, bring some information with you and you might be able to get it just fine. You might come to the library and still not be able to get the, the image and that to me would say it's probably only available in Salt Lake City or to a uh, church member. The other thing to note, if you're using this at home and you come across that information unavailable or image unavailable, is that there will be other uh, pieces of information that you wanna write down. Um, there's something called a digital folder number, um, a film number and an image number. So if you make sure that you have all that information with you when you come to the library, it'll be, um, you'll be able to find the, the image very easily. And we're gonna follow that up later and I'll show you how. But for now, let's just look at this original document because we're here in the library and we can do it. Um, when I click on that, I get sort of a little warning, not a warning, but a, mm, a uh, little note that says this record may have come from this image, but it could be slightly off. You may need to look through several surrounding images if it does not appear in this image. Hmm, intriguing. Let's take a look. And here we are. I don't know if you can see, but this um, has opened up a new tab, which I always love. Um, and we see all these little um, thumbnail images. We're looking at um, image after image after image of digitized microfilm records. And Family Search has helpfully uh, put a box around the one that is of interest to us, which is right here on the right. So I'm going to, and um, before I do that, let me just show you here that this is telling us it's. Um, image number 2570 of 2643. So lots of images in this particular record group. 
here is also uh, telling us the film number, and that's what the number would have looked like if you had found this at home. So um, at this point, you just double click on it, and it opens it up, and you can kind of scooch around and look at it. There are buttons over here to um, make it bigger or smaller. And you also have the option to print or download it to save it. There's also something called a source box, which um, because you're logged in, you have your own source box. And you can save things to your source box if it's something that you want to take a look at later or whatever. And then again, if you have a family tree, you can attach it to your family tree right here. I don't think I need to go into this record too much. We've already looked at records um, uh, and kind of seen how to read them, go through, uh, figure out who, who gave the information um, and uh, determine whether or not the information is correct, what you know. So um, that was a pretty simple um, look, at a re look at an index, find the record and um, take a look at it. I'm going to uh, go back to um, this page and hit the back button up here and go back to our list, our results. Um, there's a lot of census information, which is off, which is awesome. Some of these are not my um, person. Apparently, there was another um, Andrew Hedin who lived in Aurora, but his wife's name was Mary and had different children. So interesting. I don't think they're don't think no, they can't be anyway. Sorry, it's easy to get um, <laughs> get distracted. Okay, I wanted to show you farther down here first. Where is the there's a birth with Andrew Hedin as the father. It's this one right here. Um, this is something else you might run into. So now I'm kind of showing you um, how, to, how to navigate in this and what kinds of um, results you might find. So when I click on um, Andrew again, I get this um, little bit. Uh, I'm gonna click on this. I kind of like, um, being able to look at this and view the original document from here in case there's anything else that um, catches my eye. We get this same uh, note again. Um, so let's take a look at that. Oops. Before we do that, I'm going to go back to that image once because we need to take a look and notice that um, this uh, baby girl, Beta Catherine, that doesn't sound right. Um, so we'll have to look at the, uh, the record for that. Birth date is the 27th of May, 1887. Okay, so I've clicked on view the original document. We got that uh, little caveat announcement that um, the record might not be the right one. And here we have a record boxed out for us. Uh, when we look at it, um, lo and behold, it is not the right um, person because this looks like uh, I don't know, Claire, Grace, um, not, not our um, Vita or whatever her name was, Catherine. So um, looking around at this a little bit more, I see that her date of birth is May 28th. And you'll remember that the person we're looking for was May 27th. So now I need to do a little bit of uh, guesswork here and see if I can find or figure out how these records are organized and where I can find my, um, my record. I'm going to go up here to the left where it says what the image number is. And these two arrows pointing to the right and to the left help me navigate through the images. So when I click on the left hand one, um, now I find that I'm in a different record. Um, who was born on May 27th, but there's no name. Um, name of the father and the mother are not Hedin, so this is not my person. Let's click through a few more here. Um, I think this is kind of interesting. This person, the uh, baby was named later. Um, 
Nope, not ours, but still born on May 27th. So this is making me guess that maybe these records are sort of um, arranged by uh, name or date. Um, I don't think they're alphabetical though. Ah, here we go. This is Esther Beta Catherine Hedin, whose father down here is Andrew Hedin. So this is the person that I was looking for. Um, so that is uh, what the information or what the what it's like to find um, a record or an index to a record and not get exactly to that record and have to kind of search around a little bit. One other thing I want to point out as far as navigating in these uh, images is that over here on the left, besides um, being able to make the image bigger or smaller, you also have um, sort of a grid here. And when I click on that, I can look at all of the images. Or when I click on the piece of paper, it takes me back to just that one. Okay, I'm gonna go back, whoops, one more time to uh, our results and show you um, this record right here. Um, looks like a marriage record between Andrew and his wife, Frederica. This one looks like it's available on a family tree and also just has a paper that indicates it's just an index. Interestingly, this says check image availability this time, which I'm going to click on. And this one has a little bit different information or, or notice that pops up. Um, the information on this record came from a group of images. To view the image of this record, you will need to look through several images. So bravely, we go forward. And um, in this instance, uh, it doesn't give me an outline of any record that might be my record. It's uh, showing me this list of 1,711 records and saying, okay, Sonia, find it. <laughs> um, I'm not going to take the time now to show you how I would find something. I have that planned for later. But um, this is a possibility, and this is where... Um, you uh, hone your skills as a genealogist by digging a little harder to find that information. You know it's here, but you don't know where. So you just have to keep digging until you find it. Alrighty, let's go back to our, um, actually, I'm just gonna click the logo here to get right back to the main page. And, um, go under search again to records. There are a few other ways that we can search on here besides using this search box. As I scroll down the page a little bit, here's a um, sort of innocent looking thing that says search by place. So if you want to um, look, actually what I use this for is if I'm not sure how to research in a particular county, or country, um, if I want to know kind of what's available, um, or have a have a better idea of what I'm getting myself into, I'll go here. And for this, I'm just going to type the country name Germany. Welcome to our Germany research page. It says we've brought together tools to help you with your research in Germany. First on the left hand side here are learning courses, which um, I highly recommend. I've gone through um, and watched several of these. Again, they're free. They're like um, little webinars on, um, in this case, researching in Germany. I find these very helpful, especially for um, other countries than the United States, because um, obviously researching in another language has um, Ah, hurdles and roadblocks of its own, and it's good to know about that. So I highly recommend the learning courses here. Um, there's a link to the Family Search Wiki for Germany, and uh, 
we'll get to the family search wiki, but not right now. Um, I want to show you on the right hand side here. Uh, in this box, there are indexed historical records. So these are records that have been indexed. As you scroll down a little bit farther, there's image only historical records. And then even farther down here is catalog material, which we'll cover in um, another minute. So I'm gonna uh, take a little side trip here and explain to you what these mean. It's very important to know this um, because um, you just have to know how the whole site is, is arranged. Um, remember I told you that FamilySearch has taken their microfilm and digitized it. And um, yes, at this point in time, I believe they have digitized all of their microfilm. But digitizing the microfilm is only half the battle. The process goes something like this. They take the microfilm and take pictures of it, which is the, um, the digitizing part of it. And then they've got raw data. They've just got the pictures. Then what they do is organize these into collections, um, you know, marriage records of uh, Kane County, Illinois or whatever. But they still don't have any access points. They're still just images. You might know um, like that, uh, well, no, I'm not gonna go there. Um, so you've got the images grouped into a collection, but no access point. So that's what we've got here in these um, image only historical records. Finally then, images, the images, each individual image is indexed by a person, which means somebody has to look at that image and go through the record and find the pertinent bits of information, like the names, the dates, the places, et cetera, and make an index out of it. And that's what we search when we look through indexed records. Um, so you can see in this whole process that it would be really easy to digitize those images and um, not too hard to put them into the collection groups, but it would take a lot of time to do the indexing. And especially the way Family Search does it, um, each image, the way I understand it, is indexed by twice by different people, and then they compare. Someone compares their indexing to see how closely they've come to um, extracting the same information. And if not, there's kind of a mediator who looks at that and decides what the information is. Um, it's a good way of doing it, and I think uh, I've um, found the indexing family search to be very good. Um, and that makes me bring you back over to this current indexing projects right here. Um, they have volunteers who index um, these images. Um, it's an online volunteer project, and you could be a part of that. So if you ever feel um, like you wanna try a challenge, um, do a little bit, do some indexing. Um, I'll try and remember to show you um, where that is. All right, so let's go here and see, we've kind of um, already covered how to search an index. That was that record search that we did first. Let's take a look at um, how to look through record or image only. I'm going to go back here and instead of Germany in another language, I'm going to pick something in this country, which you can read, which would be uh, something from Wisconsin. Also to let you know, it, it's sometimes helpful to look and see what's available for a different state. Um, you can see that um, some of these are, even though this says Wisconsin, they've got things like um, billion graves and current obituaries that probably cover the whole country, but because Wisconsin is part of that, they, um, they include that here. They usually list the top five. I don't know how they come up with the top five because obviously it's not by record number, um, but then they give you the total number of records here and show you how many there are. We're gonna go down here to the um, image only historic records and 
take a look at this Wisconsin Calumet County New Holston Public Library records. Well, wouldn't you know it, I am looking for an obituary for Joanne Johnson who lived in New Holstein. Well, not really, but that's my example here. So um, let's click on that. And what we're going to do is browse the images. Um, this is helpful that it tells you what this record collection is, an obituary card file from the New Holstein Public Library. And obituaries come from the New Holstein Report. Holstein, I don't know. So <coughs> you can get an image in your mind of a card file in a library that someone has gone, gone through the local newspaper, the New Holstein Report, and written out all the obituaries. Um, and even though it says you're going to browse 10,000 images, we are not going to be daunted by that. And let's see why. Up at the top here, which is easy to miss because it doesn't look like much, um, it says surname range, A through F, G through K, and so on. So they've broken down those 10,000 records for us already by letting us choose an area of the alphabet that would be helpful to look through. And Johnson is in the G through K, so we're going to go there. Look, we're down to 2,400 items. Piece of cake. All right. Um, so if we're going to G through K, J should be about in the middle. Let, and I'm going to kind of talk through my process here of how I would find out um, how to do these records. I am certainly not going to look through every single image until I get to Johnson because these are all G's and obviously they're alphabetical so I don't need to do that. I'm going to guess that the J's start about halfway through so up here in the corner and in, in image I'm going to put 1200 and um, jump to image 1200. Well, that gets me into the HOE, so not quite halfway through. I need to go a little farther, and just out of the air, I'll try 1500. Let's see where that gets me. That's not 1500, that's 1201. There we go. Well, now I'm in the J's. Very good. JO's even closer. So let me see how long it's going to take me to get to Johnson. Joder, Jors, Johnson, Alton, Johnson, Joanne. Here we go. So without too much work and certainly not um, browsing through 1500 images, we found the card file on to that will take us to Joanne Johnson's obituary. Now, as far as family search is concerned, this is as far as we're going to go. But someone at that library, bless their hearts, has gone through the obituary and written down her name, her maiden name, her birth and death date. Um, guessing that because this is Plymouth next to her birth date, that's where she was born. Um, here's a marriage date with a name after it. So that's probably who she married. Um, survivor's husband, um, not named, so I bet this is him. She had one son, Jack, who's married to Karen, and three daughters um, who were married in one odd, it looks like. And then up here in the top right-hand corner is a date, which I would guess is the date of the newspaper. So you can take this information, and you're not going to stop here because you're a great genealogist and you know that you always want to look at the original source. So your next step would be to hunt down the New Holstein report, I believe that's what it was called, and find this obituary. Uh, and just a little plug, in May we'll be talking about newspapers, so we might actually be able to find that. I'll see if I can see what I can do about that. So I hope that was helpful um, to show you how to um, 
jump around and make educated guesses and find an item in a collection when you don't know exactly where it is, but you know that it might be there. Kind of like that marriage record that we found. Um, let's go back. And um, I just wanted to point out this, uh, no, 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 not that. Up again to the search records page. Um, this section here, uh, find a collection. Um, I don't find this to be helpful, to be honest, and I don't use it very much, but um, if uh, you wanted to find that obituary index again, um, this is where you might go to say, you know, I, whoops, didn't click in there. You know, I knew there was something about um, New Holstein and, here it is. So you can um, type in words that are in the title of the collection and find them here. And that'll take you right back to where we were before. All right. That's the search records section in a nutshell. We hope your heads aren't spinning yet because we've got more fun ahead of us. We're going to go to the catalog next. And this is where the real power is in um, family search, I think. And it's a great place that you can really dig down deep and cover as many collections as possible with very little effort. Point to th remember here is that you're not gonna be searching for your ancestors by name, but for collections that might have information on them or might be relevant to them. Um, I hope that will become more clear as we go along. Little different search box here. This says you can search by place. You can search by surnames, um, by titles, by author, subjects, and keywords. You can try those out and see what comes up, but we're just gonna concentrate on place today. And then also we're gonna go back and we're gonna um, revisit that um, film, uh, film number uh, digital folder number that we talked about earlier. So um, the place um, is the default. And I would say that 95% of the time, this is where you'll go because um, just like real estate and genealogy, location, location, location is very important. Um, you can search by a country, you can search by a state, you can search by a county, you can search by a town, or what I would recommend is search them all. Um, different records are available at different geographical and um, governmental late levels. So what I usually do is go to a place, see what's there, and then go through the categories that look most relevant or helpful to me. Um, our First example is going to be Princeton, Illinois, which is down here in um, Bureau County. And you know that I didn't notice that I didn't start out with Illinois. Start with the smallest um, level, if you will, and um, then it will start populating with all the different Princetons. Um, so here's my Illinois. Type that in and then hit search. And what you get is a list of what we in the library world call subject headings. Um, and then the number afterwards of how many record collections are under each subject heading. So when you click on this or click on the little arrow to the left, it opens up the subject heading, which in this case is church history and shows you the three different um, collections available under church history in Princeton. There's also church records, not much. Just one from the 75th anniversary of the organization of the Presbyterian Church. Um, here's a history of Princeton and um, three different uh, collections from newspapers, marriage extractions, whatever. Each one of these is something that you can click on. And um, as an example, I'm gonna look at this one that's called Mini of Princeton 
and I can't read the rest of it because it's in Swedish. But we're genealogists. We are not deterred by foreign languages because we know well, we can often find things without having to speak another language. So I'm going to click on that. And it turns out that this is a book. This tells me that right there, books, monographs. And um, happily, there's a digital version of it. So all I have to do is click here to find that. It's not a bad idea to um, read the rest of this, although not particularly um, helpful about that telling me any more information. Let's just click and see what it's all about. So right here, again on the right, is information. It's a 75-page book um, in Swedish uh, about um, the Princeton Swedish Lutheran Church. Here's a picture of the cover and a little uh, thing that invites us to view inside. So now we're opening up and looking at a digital um, image of this book. Up on the top here are all kinds of different icons. And as you um, hover over them, it tells you what they do. You can make it rotate. You can adjust the contrast. Um, what it doesn't tell you, well, and here's a page viewer right here. Um, so if you want to go page by page, you can just kind of hit your um, right arrow button on your keyboard and go from page to page or use this little thing right here. Um, but another thing that's very helpful is up here at the top, see the, the um, magnifying glass. That's our search box. So when I click on that, I can put in um, my ancestor's last name, which I need to double check on the spelling. L-I-N-G-R-E-N, -E I was right. And that will search and find five results within this 75-page booklet which have links and when I click on them, it will show me. I was jumping up and down and doing the genealogy happy dance when I found this because this is a picture of another great great grandfather um, who I never even knew about before. Now I've got a picture of him. So I thought that was pretty cool. And um, some of the other things in here, this picture, here he is again, you can, it's kind of barrel chested, so it stands out there. Um, there's a picture of him and uh, look at that, his wife, Anna is, um, which one is he? I think she's this one right here. Um, so another picture there, go to the third one. Um, I think that was Anna again. Well, it doesn't say if it's a man or woman, but I think that was uh, his wife. And um, then here, uh, there's a picture or a list of diaconer, which sounds to me like deacons with his name. So um, like I said, even though I can't read this book in Swedish, I get some good information from it. So um, just don't be dismayed by foreign language material. All right. So back to search results, that was looking at Princeton. Now I'm going to go into my place name and put Bureau County, which is the county that Princeton is in. Let's see what they have there. A lot more than just the town. Um, this is why you want to search town, county, state, a lot of different information or a lot of different things available. Um, let me see, in um, county information, the thing that I usually go to first is um, vital records. And um, maps, I love maps. And I wanted to show you, um, I think it's this one. Again, a digital version, which we can view. That, as I click through it, I can find that um, atlases are more than maps. Um, for instance, if I 
my ancestor is not John S. Skinner, but I would be doing another happy dance here if it were, because that's a great picture of him. He looks like he's um, an insurance salesman. Uh, going to this next page here, I was excited to see this because um, my grandmother worked in the first national bank. So now I see what the bank looked like on the outside and on the inside. Maybe she stood behind there and was a, a teller. Actually, she wasn't. She was a bookkeeper. So um, she did other things. But maybe she looked out of those windows onto Princeton. I don't know. Anyway, and here are the maps. Um, so much fun to see. Uh, Board of Supervisors. Um, sometimes atlases have pictures of houses in them. If you're lucky enough to have an ancestor who lived in a photographable house. Um, just a lot of fun things there. So check out the maps too. So um, that's my point there. Look in the town. Look in the county, naturalizations. Um, another good thing to find at the county level are probate records. And um, I've got another example from a different county to show you about that. This is also gonna show you um, more of a technique on um, how to find records. I'm looking at Henry County in Illinois. I'm going to look at the probate records there. And the one that I want to take a look at is not looking familiar to me. Let's try this Wilson index. It's that one. Yes. Okay, so there's um, no direct way into this. We have um, gone into this and now we're faced with a little bit about what this is and then a long list of microfilm. Um, over here on the right, you'll see that these formats are in digital form. So I'll be able to look at the pictures. If you do this at home, you might sometimes find a picture of the um, camera with a key over it, and that means it's locked to you and you cannot view those images from home. Like the Illinois death, um, deaths and stillbirths, I think is what, the what it was called. Um, those images were locked and you couldn't look at them from home, but they are available in the library. Okay, so, um, the first one is an index to the will record. And then all of these are books, um, looks chronological to me, um, even though these are A, B, C, D, E, it's not alphabetical, they're chronological. But even if I know who my person, where my person would, when my person died, sometimes probate is years later, um, anytime you can find a will, uh, a will index, it's good. So let's take a look at this index to the will. And before we go, we're going to note on here that it's item four on the film. I click on my little camera and it takes me to that big, long grid of pictures. Now here's a black box, I, I don't wanna look, we don't need to look at it, but it says number one. And you'll remember that the index that we wanted to use is item number four. So I'm going to um, scroll down here. I wish there was, were a scroll bar on this, but there's not. But you can see now here, I'm at the end of number one and I've come to item number two. So this is something different. Scrolling again. Here's the end of number two. And now we're at number three. So we keep on scrolling until we find number four right here. Now I'll take a look at this. 
and you can see how this says Henry County index to will records item number four. This is what we're looking for. Let's take a look at the next page. I think this is kind of cool. Sometimes when they do this, they show you a picture either of the spine or of the, the book cover. So yes, this was a real book in a courthouse and somebody took it off the shelf and microfilmed it. Um, and here we are in the index to wills with a list starting uh, sort of alphabetically. It has names that start with A, but the, but the names are not alphabetical. I think this is where it gets to be chronological, but there's no date. So um, I chose to uh, look up uh, Nels Anderson here. Um, this is the probate number or the certificate number. And this is volume H on page 526. So we write that information down and that's all we can get out of this index. Now we're going to go back to that page with all the will record books. And we now we know that he's in volume H, which is here in G through I. So I'm going to go over here and click on my camera again and look at the grid that shows me. Now here we have number one, which probably is G. Remember, does it even say? I don't think so. But remember how it had G, H, and I? G, it would make sense for G to be one, H to be number, or yeah, H to be number two, and um, I to be the last one. So it should have three items here. Let's scroll down and see if we can find the second one. Actually, um, I think it's kind of far down. And we could scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. I'm going to, which is what I did, but I'm going to save you the tedium of that. And um, up here in my image number box, um, let me just show you uh, image number 329 that took a bit of scrolling um, is number two. Okay, so now let's see if we can find page 526. Um, I'm just going to take a wild guess at 500 and see what I've got there. What page am I on here? Page 298. Well, that's a little bit far away from um, the page 526 that I want. So let's jump another 100 and go to page 498. We're getting close. Okay. Um, I'm going to save you any more time. And then I just kind of back and forth and back and forth tried to find the right number. Here's page 526, which is actually image 614. And this is the will of Nels P. Anderson. So good thing to notice here that the page number is not the same thing as the image number. So um, you have to kind of hold two different numbers in your head at the same time. I hope that makes sense. But that is a way to kind of go from an index in a book to find the actual image in the book. All right, let's go back to, I'm gonna jump back to the very beginning here and go back to our catalog because I wanna show you how to look up a, cert, uh, a film number. So remember at the very beginning when we were looking up uh, Andrew Hedin's death information, and I told you that if you were at home, you would have found a box that said image unavailable, but it would give you further document information, including a digital folder number. We can use that in this search part down here for um, finding the film number. So I click on that and I put in um, 
the film number, which my husband gave me because he was searching from home. And you, if you find this information at home, you would write it down and bring it into the library so you can do this search here. And what that does is give me death certificates for the state of Illinois, excluding Chicago. So I click on that. And um, it says there's an index. Well, we've already gone through the index and we've seen that. So we're going to scroll down a little bit more. And um, it's a little disheartening to see that this is 27 pages long. So we're seeing the same kind of thing here that we saw in the probates, a whole long list of film numbers. And we are looking for 4008061 in this column here. Now, sometimes what I like to do is go into the very top right-hand corner of my browser, this is not a family search, and use the find feature. And you can tell I practiced this already. I type in the film number and see if I can find it. Sigh, that tells me that it's not on page one. So let's go to page two, click up here and try searching again. And look, it shows me that there's um, actually more than one, but these are all the, the right film number. Um, so then we can go to the camera, Oops. click on this, and you would have written down that it was image 2570, so we don't have to do any guessing. We already know what we're looking for. And that brings us to this image right here, which is, in fact, the death certificate that we were looking for. So um, that was kind of just a little quick and dirty search, but I wanted I want you to know that if you're searching something from home and you find something that says image unavailable, write down the document information, including the image number, and then come to the library and you can find it, hopefully find it there. All right. Um, so please, please, please uh, go through the catalog. Use your um, geographic area and uh, search out all the information that's available here. There's a lot of good um, vital information, uh, the births, marriages, and deaths, because that's what Family Search did. They went to the courthouses, they went to the churches, um, and they microfilmed all those um, records that genealogists need, and you can find them all in the catalog. All right, back to the search here. We're going to look at books because um, Family Search doesn't have just microfilm records. They have it's a library. It's the Family History Library in Salt Lake City, and they are digitizing their books. Um, not only uh, Salt Lake City, the family library, but there are partners um, that have um, also um, put their books, uh, digitized them and made them available through this library. So um, in your research, you might come across the name of a particular um, book. It's worth searching it in here to see if you can find it. I don't have a great example, but I'm just going to type in um, my Hedin uh, surname. You could also try a place, um, but I just want to show you kind of what this is. We did already look through that um, that book in Princeton, that church book, and that would probably show up here too. So sometimes you might find a book in the catalog, um, sometimes you might not. So it's a good place to try the catalog. Interesting to know here that you can tell right away when you do the book search what the access level is and if you can see it or not. And this shows you that there are some um, protected books, which means that it has copyright restrictions and it can't be viewed online. 
So um, you might want to uh, investigate interlibrary loan to your public library or um, tuck that away for your uh, dream trip to Salt Lake City when you get there. So that's what it looks like when it's uh, restricted, protected, and you can't um, look at it online. But sometimes you'll find public access and that means that you can and you'll see that same thing that we saw before view inside that um, means that you can look at it inside you can look at the whole book and search in it if you want okay that's been in a whole lot of time there but i want you to know that books are available now let's look at the research wiki you're all familiar with wikipedia um, which is an uh, encyclopedic grab bag of information with, with, that has been provided by people. The Family Search Research Wiki is genealogy information that you would need to research that has been provided by people in the genealogy world. Um, you can kind of uh, search by area and um, click on a locality. Uh, for instance, if I wanted to um, go to my look in Germany, um, click on Europe, I get a list of European countries. And here's um, Germany. Germany is actually subdivided or I can look at the whole country and um, then I get the Wikipedia page. And believe me, talk about rabbit holes, bright, shiny objects, you could get lost very easily here. Just a couple things I want you to know. First of all, there's um, great information on getting started with your genealogy, um, but there's also uh, good links to online records, Germany online records, and here they've got German states online. And here's an Ask the Family Search community. So if you had a question about researching in Germany and you were stuck somewhere, give it a try and ask the community, or maybe even um, needing a translation of something. This might be another way to get help with that. But this goes through uh, getting started with Germany research, research tools. Um, for every country, they have a good list of um, genealogical words in that language. So you can take a look at this list and you know see what you need to know and be able to easily decipher um, forms from another country. Um, so as far as doing country research, I use the wiki a lot when I'm kind of going into a new area that I'm not familiar with. Um, this can kind of help me get oriented and show me some of the things that I need to know to research that. Also, let me go to the wiki home here. You don't have to use it for just countries. You can also use um, topics like, um, Railroads. If your ancestor worked for a railroad, how do you find those records? What is that all about? The search feature here um, is uh, going through and showing you the different entries that the research wiki has having to do with railroads. Uh, looks like they're doing specific types of railroads. Maybe you had an ancestor who worked on Union Pacific. Railroad. Let's see what it says there. How do I how do I find records on that? This should give you some information. Unfortunately, there are no known Union Pacific Railroad passenger list records, but there are registers, of directors, and offices. Um, some other websites about that. Um, I think I found this very helpful when. Uh, looking for things like that too. So use that research wiki to kind of expand your genealogy knowledge. Okay. 
what haven't we looked at yet? I'm going to go back to the very beginning. And is your head exploding yet? That was a lot of information in, uh, in a short amount of time. But I do want to mention one more thing to you. Um, I told you at the beginning that this is a um, sort of an organic site that's always growing. Things are always being added to it. Down here at the very, very bottom of the home page, there is a, um, a little innocent link to their blog. If you click on that, you can see the blog posts that they've had, um, including about every week or two, they have a blog post on what they've added to family search if they added um, and it's across the country so this blog post can kind of um, usually show you for a country how many records they've added um, and if you're researching that country if you have uh, ancestors in Sao Paulo, Brazil, look at that. They've got over a million records that they've just indexed. Or um, the Canadian assessment rules, tax assessment rules in Toronto. Um, so it's good to, to keep up with that. And even looking through this might give you an idea. Um, maybe you don't have people from um, Ontario and Canada, but maybe you never thought to look for tax assessment rules before. So go to the catalog and see if you can find anything there. Um, I think once you get into this, is there a way to, there should be a way to subscribe. I did not, uh, I did not research that for you, but here you go. I think this might be a subscribe thing, print, email, if you wanna get it by email, which I do, um, or share it. So, um, that is the end of our program as far as the recording goes. I'm going to stop right now and thank you for listening on the recording. Um,